Hey everybody, how's it going? Uh, welcome to the second in a series of Friday lunchtime concerts. Hope you're all doing well. Hope this, uh, this past week of self-containment or whatever you're doing right now is going fine. I'm going to be um, running through a bunch of uh, folk songs and things like that today. Uh, folk being the, the theme for this show. Um, the reason for it, I guess, is because un until I discovered folk, I always had the presumption that maybe folk was kind of just a dusty, old-fashioned kind of a thing, best left to its own devices and left under glass and leave all the purists to it and doing their thing. And it's only when I got involved in the working in the genre and working with uh, folk musicians and folk singers that I found that to be completely uh, untrue. And I uh, found all sorts of stuff that was really valuable. Uh, and that's the kind of stuff I'd like to share with you today and sort of illustrate the point and kind of celebrate the fact that folk isn't, um, isn't a dead thing. It's a, it's a contemporary, active, living uh, music and living tradition, if you like. Uh, some people freak out at the, uh, the idea of tradition, uh, like it's an old thing that should be just left to die. But as a friend of mine pointed out to me recently, you know, he said, you know, he's a good traditional musician himself. He said, you know, uh, tradition is nothing really except peer pressure from dead people. When you think about it, and uh, he's right. And another friend said to me many, many years ago, he said, it's not an ancient music; it's a modern music with ancient roots. And you know, when you look at bands today, like the Decemberists and, and uh, people like that, they're very much um, solid in their folk roots but obviously very modern bands, and the Pogues with Shane McGowan, people like that were always big into the folk thing, but also very modern bands. Uh, and with that said, I'm going to completely contradict myself now and do a really old song. Um, but I found it in a book when I was living in Dublin, and uh, one of the reasons that I kept going into the, the, the folk idiom was because I, it became very educational for me. I uh, was always reminded of that line, I think it was some, from some... Bruce Springsteen's song where he said, I learned more from a three minute song than I ever did in school. And um, I have to say that's been very true for me over the years. This is a song called uh, Captain Kidd. And uh, it is a really old song, uh, written in 1701, which was the year that Captain Kidd was executed. <clears throat> and um, uh, a reason to believe that it was actually a song that was printed and sold at the execution site as a sort of a souvenir of your big day out. Um, with the kids watching this fella getting hung, drawn, and quartered. <clears throat> so that's what entrepreneurial spirits did back in the day. But I've talked enough, let's sing some songs. <laughs> This one's for you. Oh, my name is Captain Kidd. As I sailed, as I sailed, my name is Captain Kidd. As I sailed, my name is Captain Kidd. God's laws I did forbid, and most wickedly I did. As I sailed, as I sailed. And I murdered William Moore as I sailed, as I sailed. And I murdered William Moore as I sailed. I murdered William Moore, left him lying in his gower, forty leagues away from shore. As I sailed, as I sailed. And feeling cruel still, as I sailed, as I sailed. And feeling cruel still, as I sailed. And feeling cruel still, my gunner I did kill And his precious blood did spill as I sailed, as I sailed Now my parents taught me well as I sailed, as I sailed My parents taught me well as I sailed My parents taught me well to shun the gates of hell But against them I rebelled as I sailed, as I sailed. Uh, 
and being close on death as I sailed, as I sailed, and being close on death as I sailed. And being close on death, I did vow with every breath to walk in wisdom's path as I sailed, as I sailed. My redemption lasted not as I sailed, as I sailed. My redemption lasted not as I sailed. My redemption lasted not, my vows I did forget. Now who damnation is my lot as I sailed, as I sailed. So to execution dock I must go, I must go home. To execution dock I must go. To execution dock, lay my head along the block. No more laws will I mock, as I sail, as I sail. Song there called Captain Kidd. Um, turns out that Captain Kidd was, uh, uh, although a famous pirate, not quite as a not as big a pirate as you think. He was actually um, uh, accused of piracy much more than he actually took part in the whole pirate thing. But uh, he was pretty much framed. It turns out because he was so successful as a businessman that the uh, East India Trading Company thought saw him as too much of a threat. That's the kind of thing. When I say it's educational, I would never have found that out except I found that song and then I got curious about the guy. And um, that's a case in point of, uh, you know, some of those, there, there's sort of, a lot of folk songs are sort of a window into a world that uh, perhaps you couldn't live in yourself. But uh, getting back to the contemporary thing, as I said, that song was written in 1701. I'm going to fast forward 270 years into the 1970s with a song that was written by a Dublin man, a fella called Pete St. John. That was his stage name. Peter Mooney is his name. But... Uh, <clears throat> He wrote a lot of songs depicting life in Dublin uh, over, over his generation. And uh, living in Dublin myself for, for a few years, I uh, really grew to love the city. It's got a lot of character. It's got a lot of history. And uh, this is one of the songs that um, he wrote. And it deals with uh, the subject of a young man who is from the traveling community, which in Ireland means the, the nomadic gypsies. Um, and um, it's about his trials and tribulations. Now, there's a few slang words in here I should probably uh, tell you about, otherwise they're just going to go Phew. But um, there's a reference to a gurrier, and a gurrier is uh, a sort of a ne'er-do-well, just a layabout, uh, someone who could be more trouble than he's worth. There's a, the word polis, which is just a sort of a mispronunciation of the word police, um, and there's the word tinker, and a tinker was this kind of, is a slang term for the traveling community. It's since become a sort of a derogatory term, but it actually refers to a time in the 50s and so, when 50s and before, when uh, the traveling people would go door to door and offer to fix uh, your household equipment, your pots and your pans, and you know, put a handle back on that thing or put the brush back together, that kind of stuff. And so they were known for tinkering with uh, with different things to get them to uh, get them to work again, and that's what that's where the term tinker actually comes from. My own mother actually remembers. Um, the um, women of the traveling community coming to the door and selling uh, paper flowers that they'd made from paper and wire and sell, to sell as ornaments. The song is called Danny Farrell. <laughs> I knew Danny Farrell when his football was a can In his hand-me-downs and his welliers and his sandwiches of bran But now this pavement peasant, oh, he's a full-grown bitter man With all the trials and troubles of his travelling people's clan He's a loser, a boozer, a mere Jew user, a raider, a traitor, a people. 
people polis hate her So lonely and only what you'd call a girlier Danny Farrow, he's a man I knew Danny Farrow When we joined the National School He was lousy at the Gaelic We called him Amadon Fool But he was brilliant down the Tosco and trading objects down the pond. By the time he was an adult, all his charming ways were gone. He's a loser, a boozer, a mean Jew user, a raider, a traitor, a people polis hater, so lonely and only what you'd call a courier. Danny Farrell, he's a man. Danny Farrell, when we first signed on the dole, how he tried to hide the loss in pride that eats away your soul. But fixing pots and kettles, now that's a trade lost to the past. And there's no handouts here for tinkers, was the answer when he'd ask. He's a loser, a boozer, a me and you user, a raider, a traitor, a people polis hater, so lonely and only what you'd call a girlier. Danny Farrell is a man. I know Danny Farrell, I saw him just the other day. Drinking methylated spirits with some winos down the quay. He's 40, he's going on 80. All the hope in his eyes bereft. And the last thing that he said to me was, There's not many of us left. But he's a loser, a loser, a mean Jew user, a raider, a traitor. People polis hater, so lonely and only what you'd call a girlier. Danny Farrell, he's a man. Danny Farrell, he's a man. Danny Farrell, he's a man. Pete Mooney, the guy who wrote it, he's still with us, I think. That was, song was written in the 70s, I believe the 1970s. And um, i got to carry on with something, something very different here, I guess. And uh, I guess it's a way of illustrating the point about folk music and that it, it has no qualms about uh, crossing lines into other genres and borrowing and, uh, and uh, representing other forms within, its, within the folk uh, world. And uh, case in point is right here. This is a song I picked up when I was playing in Europe about tw 20 strange years ago. Um, and I was playing, I used to frequent this uh, club in Copenhagen. And there was a great Dublin singer there, a fella called Desi Higgins. Desi, if you're watching, I still have some questions for you about this song, that is. Um, I had the great pleasure of actually sharing the stage with Desi once there. And <clears throat> this is a song that he used to play. But the original lyrics for the song, it's actually it's something that's been attributed to Rudyard Kipling for years, uh, mistakenly by many people. Me, one of them, to tell you the truth, until I kind of figured it out. But uh, uh, Kipling at its height had a lot of imitators, and there was uh, one monologue artist and poet and actor in, in the early 20th century in London, a fella called Milton Hayes, who uh, wrote this particular monologue and called it the um, Green Eye of the Yellow God. Um, Desi used to call it the one-eyed yellow idol, but it's a, a poem. And um, the only thing I could figure out after hearing Desi sing it and me stealing it from Desi uh, was that, well, clearly someone set this to music because we're playing it as a song. Never really found out uh, who it was, and for all I know, Desi, if you're listening, it could have been Desi. I don't really know because the only time I've heard it is from people who knew Desi, other people that knew Desi, or people that are still living in in Denmark and, and, and playing the song and presumably they heard it from Desi. But uh, a very common monologue and I, I could see why it could have been attributed to Kipling. It's very Kipling-esque 
if you like, and you'll see why in a minute. I don't play it very often at all, so I hope I don't screw it up. Um, it's got a sort of a spooky theme, so I would drag it out and play it maybe on a Halloween. Seeing as Halloween only comes around once a year, and if I'm playing, I'll play it, but otherwise it doesn't really come out. But um, it's a story, kind of a dark tale to do with uh, the British military in India and the Indian culture and the mysticism of that. Ooh. Anyway, it's called the One Eyed Yellow Idol, or at least that's what I call it. There's a one-eyed yellow idol to the north of Kathmandu. There's a little marble cross below the town. There's a broken-hearted woman tends the grave of Mad Karu. And the little yellow god forever gazes down. Well, he was known as Mad Karu to the subs in Kathmandu. He was hotter than he were inclined to tell. For all his foolish pranks, he was worshipped in the ranks, and the colonel's daughter smiled on him as well. Yes, she loved him all along, with a passion that is strong. The fact that she loved him was plain to see for all. She was nearing twenty-one, and arrangements had begun to celebrate her birthday with a ball. So he wrote and he asked what present she might like from Madakaru. They met next day as he dismissed his squad. And jestingly she told him that the only thing would do would be the green eye from the little yellow god. Now the night before the dance, Karoo seemed in a trance. They chiffed at him as they puffed on their cigar But he never once did smile, he just sat there all the while Then he walked into the night beneath the stars And at dawn he returned with his shirt and tunic torn And a gash across his forehead dripping red Well they patched him right away And he slept throughout the day And the colonel's daughter watched beside his bed. And at last he awoke, he asked his tunic be sent through. She brought it, and he thanked her with a nod. And he better search the pockets, and he said, that's from Mad Carew. It was the green eye of the little yellow god. She upbraided Matt Carew in the way some women do. Strangely, though her eyes were hot and red, no, she wouldn't take the stone. Carew was left alone with the jewel that he'd risked his life to get. Now the ball was at its height on that still and tropic night, and she thought of him, she hastened to his room. And as she passed the barrack square, she could hear the dreamy air of a waltz tune drifting gently on the breeze. The door was open wide, and the moonlight shining through, and the ground was wet and slippery where she trod, and an ugly knife lay buried in the heart of Mad Carew. It was the vengeance of the little yellow god. There's a one-eyed yellow idol to the north of Kathmandu. There's a little marble cross below the town. 
broken-hearted woman tends the grave of a mad crew and the little yellow god forever gazes down that was for you Andy um, the one-eyed yellow idol really like that song I should play it more often like I said I rarely rarely do <coughs> Um, going to carry on now though with um, a contemporary song again. When I say contemporary, I mean at least the second half of the 20th century, anyway. <clears throat> and uh, this is a song that was written by a fella called Cyril Tony in 1959. Cyril Tony worked in the Navy, and um, by his own admission, he didn't really like it. He kind of went in young. Um, by the time he was 22, he had already served seven years uh, at sea. And... Um, I think he wrote this actually when he was 22. But the song is called The Grey Funnel Line. And the Grey Funnel Line, of course, is a euphemism because the merchant, the mercantile ships, of course, you had the, you had the black funnel line, uh, you had the blue funnel line. They were all commercial ships and the, uh, the Navy ships, were, it was the nickname for the Navy ships was the Grey Funnel Line because they had grey funnels. Um, but uh, Cyril wrote this um, about halfway through his tenure as a... He had kind of discovered that he was uh, much more suited to um, writing songs uh, than he was to being in the Navy, but of course he was only halfway through his tenure at the time. And uh, he wrote this while at sea. And I cannot remember for the life of me where I found this song. I mean, I'd like to tell you that I heard it from someone or I learned it from this or that. I have no clue where I got this. I don't know what that's all about. That's my... As one brain cell, it's not coming back. Don't mind the rain or the rolling sea. These weary nights never bothered me But the hardest thing in a sailor's day is to watch the sun as it dies away It's one more day On the grave It's 
so one in our day. On the grave, funnel lake. It's one more day. On the grave. Great Funnel Line by Cyril Tony. Um, carrying on with another song which is very contemporary and uh, the reason I know it's contemporary is because I wrote it and uh, I did it in my own lifetime. And I wasn't going to include any of my own songs in this because you know we're talking about folk music and stuff like that and I just wanted to represent some of the stuff that happens in folk music but um, this is definitely a sort of a folk song. Uh, and it's the song, if anybody that reads any of the stuff that I send out to uh, uh, press packages and newspapers and stuff that print stuff when I'm coming into town or something, you, they normally say something like award-winning songwriter Patsy O'Brien. And the award in question is, is, is for this next song. Um, I entered a competition that was run by the American Folk Alliance, which to me, that sound, that's very strong verbiage. The American Folk Alliance, it sounds kind of militant like they're some sort of folk Nazis or something like that. But they're a very strong organization and uh, they do good work. Don't tell anybody I just said that. Um, but they ran a competition um, for songwriters to write about um, Sacco and Vanzetti, Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti, the Italian anarchists who were executed wrongly in the 20s here in the States in Massachusetts. Um, the challenge of the, of the competition was to write um, a song about a historical event but to contemporize it and this is what I'm talking about here with folk music is to write is to um, give it a contemporary feel or allude to some contemporary aspect of a historical event uh, and why that historical event might be uh, relevant today <clears throat> so that's what I tried to do and apparently they liked it so I won the competition and I got the award um, got a whole chunk of money and uh, they passed the song on to Joan Baez Joan never called me back. She's a busy woman, I get it. Yeah. The song is called Sacco and Vanzetti. Sacco and Vanzetti, and in parenthesis, rise and unite. Try your freedom far to gain. It was a nation scared, no reasons would they hear explain. And for your views, you were accused, and murderers they had you called. And with sentence passed, they finally did rest when you were dead and gone. Sacco and Vanzetti were gone. Though you traveled far, your words have faded none. Though the voices of generations have come and gone. Though they stole the breath from flesh and bone, your voice is far to quell. Well, they tried and failed, your words have prevailed, we're keeping them alive and well, we're keeping them alive and well. For today the migrant workers sing the words they know so well, of a worker's right to rise and unite, words that we heard you tell, words that we heard you tell. So come all you working sons of a foreign land Take heed your rights always and understand That the right to choose to air their views Two men had stripped away And though they're gone, their words linger on 
Remember your rights today. Remember your rights today. For today the migrant workers sing the words they know so well of a workers' right to rise and unite. Words that we heard you tell. Words that we heard you tell. So there you have it, Sacco and Benzetti, Rising United. I think that might make it onto the next record. I don't know yet. Thinking about it. Anyway. Um, yeah, I kind of... I wrote that in in the folk style, if you like, and I sort of um, had to sort of um, invoke the spirit of one of my favorite singers in Ireland, a fella called Luke Kelly, uh, who sang with the Dubliners for years and was a great collector of song and a great deliverer of song. So when I was writing that, I was kind of trying to uh, contact my inner Luke and uh, asking myself, what would Luke do? Um, there's another song here that I, I want to play for you based in historical fact um, and uh, kind of stood the test of time over the years and it was collected by various archivists uh, in, in pieces uh, across Europe and some and parts of America. There was a verse found here and a verse found there. I believe there was even a verse or two or a line or two found in Russia, believe it or not. I'd have to get that uh, you know, clarified, but I think so. But it was found in its total in West Cork uh, from the singer uh, singing of Bess Cronin back in the 40s or 50s when a collector and great musician called Seamus Ennis found it, I believe. A song called The Good Ship Kangaroo. And uh, <clears throat> a couple of things about this song um, uh, that are pretty interesting is that uh, The Good Ship Kangaroo was indeed a ship uh, that sailed uh, through Milford Bay out of, uh, and was built in Bristol, uh, no, sorry, built in Liverpool, I think maybe in the late 1700s and when they put it to rest as was the tradition, they put it to rest in Bristol Harbour, I believe, or Bristol Bay, whatever it's called. Um, this is kind of a story of unrequited love, if you like. Um, but there's a couple of things in here. One is the uh, the reference in the last verse to a thing called China Hottentot, which I never had a clue what that meant um, until uh, I found out that uh, because the song of its time could not, or at least it wasn't politically correct, to uh, refer to opium, um, they refer to opium as China Hottentot, which you'll hear later in the song. The other thing is there's a, there's a mention of a company, a uh, commercial company called Chapel and Son and Co. Um, basically the protagonist finds that his girl has ran off with a guy who works for Chapel and Son and Co. And uh, Chapel and Son and Co. were also a company. And it's believed by some that the song was actually uh, designed as a sort of an advertising for, for the company and mentioning the company in the song that became a popular ballad. It was a way of advertising the company. I'm not sure about that, but it's a good story. Anyway, it's a relatively lighthearted kind of a song that I heard first from uh, the singing of Christy Moore. A steward and I cooked to me boys on board the kangaroo. Well, I never thought she would prove false or even prove untrue as we sailed away through Milford Bay on board the kangaroo. Well, think of me, oh, think of me, she mournfully did say. While you are on some foreign shore and I am far away Won't you take this lucky thrippany bit Just to help you keep in mind The love and trust and faithful heart You left in tears behind Cheer up, cheer up, my own true love Don't you cry so bitterly But she sobbed, she sighed, she choked, she cried She could not say goodbye Now I won't be gone for very long 
it's but a month or two And when I will return again, well of course I'll marry you Now I never thought she would prove false, or even prove untrue As we sailed away through Milford Bay on board the kangaroo ship it was homeward bound from many's the foreign shore and it's many's the foreign present unto my love i bore i had tortoises from tenerife toys from timbuktu i had a china rat i had a bengal cat i had a bombay cockatoo and up i saw her dwelling in the streets above the town where an ancient dame upon the line was hanging out her gown where is my love Oh, she's married, sir. About six months ago, with the smart young man that drives the van for a chapel and son and co. Well, I never thought she would prove false, or even prove untrue, as we sailed away through Milford Bay on board the kangaroo. So here's a health to dreams of married life. Soap and the suds and the blue, and to hearts romance and patent starch and the washing soda too. I'll go up on some foreign shore, no longer can I stay, and on some china hot and tot I'll throw myself away. Now my love she is no foolish girl, her age it is two score, and my love she is no spinster, she's been married twice before, and I cannot say it was her wealth. Stole my heart away She's a washer in the laundry For one and nine a day Well I never thought she would prove false Or even prove untrue As we sailed away through Milford Bay On board the kangaroo I think that was re uh, recorded by Planksty back in the hmm, 74 or something like that. I think if you want to go and check it out, I'm sure there's probably other versions of it out there too. Um, I'm going to carry on here with another example of something that I did uh, a few years ago um, that kind of illustrates a point if you like. But back in 2016, there was a lot of activity based around um, commemorating the 1916 rising in Dublin, the rising that was part of and led to uh, the independence of the Republic of Ireland. And um, there was, I knew a lot of musicians and a, a lot of bands across uh, in Ireland and here in the States who um, did various things to commemorate and celebrate the centenary of that. And I kind of felt that I should and I, I wanted to. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't find a way to write a song. Uh, I, I, at least I couldn't find a, write, find a way to write a song that didn't sound repetitive or like it's already been said um, so I gave up and I started looking at the men that were actually involved in that um, in that or some of the men that were involved in that rising and uh, you know it has to be said that even though it was an armed rebellion uh, there were many men there who were not trained soldiers and were not military men they were scholars they were creative men they were poets and writers um, involved in, in that uprising and uh, one such man was a fellow called Thomas McDonough who um, a couple of months after the rising was uh, martyred, executed at the age of 19 in Dublin. Um, but he had left behind him a, a lot of great poetry, a lot of good poems. And uh, this is one um, that he wrote, which is, um, it, it's not a poem of armed struggle or anything like it, or the, the need to rebel or, or freedom. It is simply to do with uh, the coming of spring. And I thought it was a beautiful, uplifting poem and a great way to uh, to remember the man, <clears throat> because he will always be associated with the 1916 Rising, but I thought let's associate him with some of his own creative works. So I just put music to his poem, and uh, that was my contribution to the, to the celebrations and commemorations of 1916. This is called In the End. The 
song that I'll sing Should have told you an Easter story Of a long sweet spring Of its gold and its feasts and all its glory Of the moons then that carried green May To mellow September Long noons that never tarry Life's hail and farewell to remember And the haste of our years Has rushed to the fall of our sorrow To the waste of our tears The hush and the pall of all our morrows To the fall of our sorrow, to the waste of our tears, the hush and the pall of all our morrows. The song that I'll sing should have told you an Easter story of a long sweet spring, of its gold and its feasts and all its glory. It's gold and it's feasts and all its glory. in demo form with a great bunch of musicians here in St. Paul called, uh, collectively called Captain Caliber and the Drunken Landladies. I was a proud uh, drunken landlady while we, uh, while we were together gigging and stuff like that. And hopefully we'll get back together at some point and do some more shows. But uh, kind of went into the studio, did a couple of things. That was one of them. Hasn't really seen the, the light of day yet, but it will someday, I hope. So, um, that was sort of a, you know, a kind of a contemporary folk song, if you like. I think it takes all the boxes. I'm going to go back. Uh, this is another contemporary song that goes, that deals with a subject from way back, though. And it was, um, I believe it was written by a great um, folk singer, songwriter, and author uh, in London, a fella called Leo Russelson. Um, the most famous version of this um, was probably recorded by Dick Gahan. And... Um, it, it's a, it deals with a subject in the 1600s in England um, when a, a bunch of um, what you might call anarchists or precursors to the anarchist movement got together and they started to reclaim unclaimed common land, if you will. Land that was um, open to the public, if you like, but they decided to farm it and, uh, because of the economic divide in the country between the ruling class and the not ruling class, or the, the haves and the have-nots. They wanted to be uh, allowed a place where they could uh, take some common ground and farm it. Um, and it was, a, it was a dream that they held um, that was eventually, uh, eventually ransacked. But um, they were collectively known as termed the diggers and sometimes called the levelers, which brings me to a point where back when I was uh, in punk rock bands in the 90s, there was a pretty prominent band out of Manchester called the levelers. A bunch of young lads playing loud rock and roll but got their name from um, the, these bunch of guys in the 1600s or so. The song is called uh, World Turned Upside Down. And again, this is one I rarely, rarely play, so if I screw this up, forgive me. And I'm really gonna try hard to play the in tune version.
in 1649, St. George's Hill. A ragged band they called the Diggers came to show the people's will. Came for... mm -hmm. They were the dispossessed to reclaim what was theirs. We come in peace, they said, to dig and sow. We come to work the land together. We come to make the waste ground grow. The earth divided, we will make whole. So it can be a common treasury for all. Your sin of property, we do disdain. No man has any right to buy and sell the air for private gain. With theft and murder, you took the land. And everywhere the walls spring up at your command. You made the laws, you made them well. The clergy dazzled us with heaven, then it damned us into hell. But we will not worship the worlds you serve. The God of greed who feeds the rich when the poor men starve. and eat together. We have no swords. We don't bow down to any master. We don't pay rent to any lords. For we are free men, though we be poor. Come diggers all, come stand for glory. Stand up now. From the men of property, the orders came. To all the hired men and troopers, take down the diggers claim. Tear down their cottages, tear up their corn. They were dispersed, the law came and moved them on. Now you poor take courage, you rich take care. The earth was made a complexity for everyone to share. All things in common, all people one. They came in peace, and the vision lingers on. All things in common, all people want. There you go, we're all turned upside down, or at least most of it. Um, I'm going to carry on here. I mentioned earlier on a guy called Luke Kelly that a lot of you, of course, will be familiar with, but some of you will not. And uh, like I said, Luke was a guy who um, collected a lot of songs and delivered them in his own uh, immutable fashion. And I became a sort of a powerhouse in Irish folk music. And certainly sort of one of my go-to guys if I'm looking to find some new songs. He's not with us anymore, he died, died quite a while back, but uh, this, uh, this next song is, is uh, quite common within the folk canon, but it, uh, I love the way Luke uh, delivered it, and so his, his version was kind of the one that I referenced when, when I was learning this. But it's another song from America uh, um, from the early days of um, organized labor and labor activism, and uh, there was a man in the middle of that in the 20s, uh, not the 20s, earlier than that, the teens uh, and tens, who uh, um, was regarded as a labor activist, uh, prominent uh, songwriter and activist actually as well, and he invented the term, here's a little bit of trivia for you, the term pie in the sky comes from him. He was known as Joseph Hillstrom, um, real name Joseph uh, Hillsgood, I think, of Swedish extraction. Um, but uh, he was a man who was um, framed uh, and executed for a murder he didn't commit, again, because, like Sacco and Benzetti, he was what many people regarded to be uh, a troublemaker. Um, and a f uh, it was a fellow called Earl Robinson, I believe, that wrote this song, um, who died in 1991. But it's a song that's almost synonymous with folk music, um, certainly in this country, and I, like I said, I heard it from... Um, Lou Kelly's recording uh, when he was singing with the Dubliners, and, and the song is called uh, the song is called Joe Hill.
I dreamt I saw Joey last night Alive as you are me Says I to Joe, you're ten years dead I never died, says he I never died, says he In Salt Lake Joe, says I to him And him standing by my side well, they framed you on a murder charge But says Joe, I never die Says Joe, I never die But the copper bosses, they shot you, Joe They filled you full of lead well, It takes more than guns to kill a man Says Joe, and I ain't dead Says Joe, and I ain't dead and standing there as large as life And smiling with his eyes The thing that they could never kill Went on to organize Went on to organize From San Diego and up to Maine In every mine and mill Where working men defend their rights That's where you'll find Joe Hill That's where you'll find Joe Hill I dreamt I saw Joe Hill last night Alive as you are me Says I to Joe, you're ten years dead I never died, says he I never died, says he Joe Hill, <clears throat> once again talking about the contemporizing of, of an old song, there's something else that came up um, a couple of years back, uh, and I, I felt like doing this and putting it into a, a, folk, um, a folk frame. This is a song that I kind of came across one Halloween. Uh, my wife and I were carving pumpkins on the couch and watching old movies, and one of the movies was um, um, The Picture of Dorian Gray. The old one, uh, I think it was recorded in like 33, made in 33, with uh, Hurt Hatfield as Dorian Gray. And the love interest was a very, very young Angela Lansbury. Never seen her that young before. Um, I think it might have actually been sort of her screen debut, if you like. Could be wrong about that. But um, she played um, a music hall performer and sort of um, waitress, bar, bar server. And uh, in the... Uh, in the movie, she sings this song in a very music hall fashion as she's going about serving beers and stuff like that at the tables. And I remember kind of listening to it, uh, and it sounded just like, any, like in the style of an early 1900s or late 1800s music hall song, but the words were kind of sticking out to me. And I, I thought, well, that's kind of... Did people actually sing about that in the music hall? I don't know. So I had to go and do a bit of exploration on the song. I found out what the song was, and I looked it up, and uh, I found that it was written, indeed, as a music hall song by a fella called Charles William Murphy. So I thought, well, there's a guy with Irish roots, um, living in London, I guess. But um, clearly the song had to do with, uh, the lyrics at least, made more sense that it might have come from an Irishman because it had something to do with uh, liberty, freedom, emancipation. Something that Charles William Murphy would not have seen in his lifetime in that generation. Um, but I decided to take the words and, 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 and put them into a, a folk styling because I knew damn well I wasn't going to sing a music hall song, not in the style of Angela Lansbury. Um, it just wasn't going to happen. So, uh, so uh, I've been playing it out every so often. And it's uh, proven popular at the live shows, so there's no reason why I shouldn't play it for you now. Because this is a live show, if you know what I mean. I'm still getting my head around that concept. Anyway, I call the song, I think it's called The Yellow Bird. I, I just call it The Yellow Bird. 
Lyrics by Charles William Murphy. Oh, the snow, it was plentiful, and the crumbs, they were so few, and the weather-weary sparrow through the castle window flew. And it was there she spied a golden cage, and a sweet love song she heard, all from the pet canary there, a handsome yellow bird. And he sang, my little sparrow, I've been struck by Cupid's arrow, won't you spend your time with me? And she spied around his castle, with its ribbon and its tassel, and plaintively said she, Goodbye, my little yellow bird. I would rather brave the cold on a leafless tree than a prisoner be, all in your cage of gold. And the spoiled and petted yellow bird, he could scarce believe it true that a common sparrow could refuse a one with blood so blue. He explained of all advantages, of riches and of gold, and she explained her liberty would not be bought or sold. So she said, I must be going, and he cried, oh, but how it's snowing and the winter winds do blow. Won't you stay, my little dearie? Without you I'll be weary, and still she cried, oh no. Goodbye, my little yellow bird. I would rather brave the cold on a leafless tree than a prisoner be, all in your cage of gold. Oh, goodbye, my little yellow bird. I could gladly stay with you. I could love you, my little yellow bird, but I love my freedom too. Yellow bird, as I call it. Um, I'm going to start winding down now with a couple, another couple of songs, and these are songs that, although they're sort of, they're songs um, that that are from me. They're, they're, I deliberately wrote in a sort of a folk styling, uh, and in a, and in in in, in, a, in a an effort to contemporize as well. Uh, this next one is a, a song that I pretty much grew up with, and a lot of a lot of folk singers back in Ireland and Scotland did. Um, and I recorded it some years ago with a great buddy of mine, Matt Mancuso, a fiddle player. And um, <clears throat> it's such a strong song. It's, the reason some of these strong songs are still around, I think, is because they're just so strong. The melodies are so strong that you just can't break them. Um, this is a case in point, I think. Um, song uh, originally from Scotland, I believe. Um, I'm trying to think of the guy's name. I think it's Hamish Himlock was, was where it came from originally. But I got it again from uh, the singing of Christy Moore. The version I recorded here with Matt, though, is um, very different. And uh, and I, I have no excuse for this at all whatsoever. Uh, uh, maybe boredom, maybe a short attention span. I don't know, but uh, we put it in, the song into the setting of a sort of a bossa nova. And uh, I like to joke that it's probably may well be the only traditional Scottish bossa nova in existence. Could be wrong about that, too. Correct me if I am. The song is called Black is the Color. is the color of my true love's hair. And 
her lips are like some roses fair She has the sweetest smile The gentlest hand Yes, and I love the ground Whereon she stands I love my love And it's well she knows And I love the ground Where on she goes Sweet as the day It soon would come Where my love and I To the Clyde, yes, I mourn and weep for satisfied. I never can be. I wrote her a letter, a few short lines, and I suffered death a thousand times. Black is the color of my true love's hair. Sweet is mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's me screwing up the words. She has the sweetest smile, the gentlest hand. Yes, and I love the ground whereon she stands. Yes, I love the ground. Black is the color, apart from two lines. Um, I'm going to finish up here with a song. Uh, again, I wrote it, but um, keeping ticking a couple of the, well, quite a few of the folk boxes here. It's uh, something that it's a narrative that tells a story. Um, <clears throat> it's in the style of an earlier genre. It's in the style of a sort of a uh, sea shanty type thing, not unlike Captain Kidd, which was at the opening of this uh, show. But um, and I also wrote it for a particular occasion. I wrote it uh, um, when I was asked to play in Durango, Colorado, uh, a couple of years ago. It was maybe a year ago. And I wanted to write a song for them. And so that's kind of something that within the folk tradition happens quite a lot. Um, one of the characteristics of folk music, I think, that really appeals to me is that within folk music, it's generally the emphasis is on the song as opposed to the singer. Um, it's just about delivering something and, uh, and then leaving it there and walking away. It's a song called Jack Bryan. One blow after another caused the rocks to fly and fall. Jack Bryan, he swung his pick, drove a hole in the mountain wall. He never raised his head, the only thing we'd hear him say was, Boys, bring on the trolley, we have one more load to haul away. Haul away, haul away, boys, bring on the trolley, one more load to haul away. Jack Bryan, he'd been a carpenter, and a sailor, and a smith. And he'd oft heard told of the Rockies' gold lying hidden deep within. So he brought his darling Mary, and the one they had on the way. And he promised her a castle, before his soul they'd come and haul away. Haul away, haul away, promised her a castle, before his soul they'd haul away. Swing that pick boy. Rise it to the stars, 
pray they always shine on us and find us where we are. Then came that early morning and the shout from down below. It said, Jack, come quick, your Mary's sick. The labor's laying her low. The doctor sent me run. He said, return without delay. Just go and get Jack and bring him back before her soul. They come and haul away, haul away, haul away. Go and get Jack and bring him back before her soul. They haul away. Now Jack's giant hands were gentle, he just smiled and closed the cheek. And through the tears he said, Mary dear, no castle will there be. Unless you're right here with me, I won't build and I won't stay. Hold my hand dear Mary, or it's me they'll have to haul away, haul away, haul away. Hold my hand dear Mary, it's me they'll haul away. Mary's lips were silent, she just smiled and closed her eyes. As she drifted away, so the nurses say, till she heard the baby's cries. She says, Jack, I heard the trumpets come to call on me this day. But it's here I'll stay, and have to wait for my soul to come and haul away, haul away, haul away. It's here I'll stay, and have to wait for my soul to haul away. Swing that pick, Jack. Raise it to the stars, pray they always shine on us, find us where we are. Young Willie Brine bides his time underneath the morning sun, and with all he knows of the town below, there's plenty to be done. So he kissed his darling mother, and he heard his father say, Willie, don't work the men too hard, you know there's always more to haul away, haul away, haul away. Willie, don't work the men too hard, there's more to haul away. Jack Bryan, and I'll leave it there for today. Thanks for uh, listening. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, let me know in the comments uh, how you feel about all that, and if you have any, uh, any, uh, anything to add to some of my historical inaccuracies, if they're there, uh, let me know. And um, I'll see you back here next week with a different show. So uh, enjoy the weekend. Talk to you soon. Bye now.